Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, it's a little weird. I okay, now I see myself. Hi, <laughs> everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Irina, and everyone. I'm really sorry I'm not there live, but I do hope you're having a great time. And I'm really grateful I can be with you at least here in spirit uh, presentation. So as Irina was saying today, we're going, I'm going to talk with you about business websites and the words we use to get to what uh, marketers call a conversion. So actually having someone do something after they visit your website, which means getting in contact with you and hopefully buying from you. And we're first starting to think of this conversation and how I would go about telling you about websites. I didn't want to go generic, so I thought of someone that could help us understand and go through this, this topic. And this someone is Mark. Now, uh, Mark is a, a freelance translator with all the perks and the glitter that you can imagine. As you can see, he has a stunning background, all the fancy letters in the name because he studied so hard and that lots of qualifications and credentials. He has rock solid experience working mostly with LSPs for over 10 years. He cares about his continuing education. So he has specialized courses and uh, any kind of uh, uh, professional update he can get. He's very fluent with cat tools and has a few publications under his belt, you know, you name it. Anything you can think uh, that fits in a solid uh, professional profile for a translator, Mark has it. <coughs> Mark, he's in really new to business and this business has been very good for a while, for over 10 years. He mostly worked with agencies, as I said before. But nowadays, things are a little different because, you know, there are some things that are changing within the industry, outside of the industry and reflecting in the industry. Mm. And his business is kind of getting slow and slower. So he knows that if he wants to stay afloat, he has to do something, namely find new clients. So he finds himself tasked with a challenge. How do you go about finding new clients? Possibly as soon as possible so that this low time result in a slump or a setback. So the first thing that Mark would do and the first thing that any translator or professional in general within this scenario would be to gauge his options. And as you know, a professional translator has a few options when going on the hunt to find new clients or expanding his business or making adjustments to his business to make sure it stays well and thriving. So he thinks about maybe branching out with adding a few different services, or he could think about uh, specializing further in something or opening a new stream of business that might be complementary to language service, but not that necessarily related to language services themselves. Or it could continue pursuing agency outreach as he has, but you know, the problem is that a response from agencies has, hasn't been very successful for him and the competition is up and all the usual problems. So at a certain point, Mark thinks, that he really likes what he want, what he does. He doesn't want to branch out as a web designer or anything else. He likes translation. He wants to work in the translation business and he would love to continue working with agencies because it's been well and lovely ever since, but he needs to fill in some gaps. So he thinks, okay, you know what? I know the people I've been working for for the last 10 years through the middleman. So I'm going to hunt for direct translation clients. This is something that uh, most translators do. So you probably might want to, might, or could relate to, to Mark when he creates his perfect action plan. Okay, 
I'm going to create or revamp my professional website and talk to the direct client instead of the agency, I'm going to get tons of traffic, tons of leads. I'm going to get rich and live happily ever after. Now, the action plan as is might sound perfect. And in a way, it is. He's used to working with companies in certain uh, industries or fields. So he knows a little more about the context and not just the problems that are usually embedded within the, the translation project. But this is also where uh, Mark's journey or any translator's journey wanting from to move from one scenario to the other might fall into there is a trap in there because even though uh, mark knows the company is been working with through the agencies is really not thinking about the fact that right now trying to target new agents new direct clients instead of agencies meaning means having a change in your target audience and even though he knows a bit about them he soon finds out that they are very different targets so um, for starters their different lies in the, the understanding and the awareness of what translation entails of course an agency client a project manager with about the translation process what does it need to get right what are the steps what's this and that and the cat tools and the need for a glossary and reference files etc <clears throat> i'm sorry uh, mr direct client on the other end in the vast majority of, of occasions doesn't know about this and he honestly doesn't care because as you will see they also have other differences. They don't really speak the same language when it comes to what's a translation to them and for them. They also have different needs. Mr. Project Manager actually goes uh, on professional websites to find people to recruit for an agency. This doesn't mean that he has a project to take on and get done right here and right now. Of course, it means that he's looking for a way to expand their database and their list of potential collaborators for whatever project comes at hand. Mr. Direct Client, on the other hand, when he goes on a hunt for a translator, most of the times isn't thinking about the long-term relationship and the business partner. He needs to get a translation done right here, right now, hopefully by yesterday. So you see different level of awareness and different needs. And of course, with that also comes a different mindset. As we said before, Mr. Project Manager is in for the long run. Mr. Project Manager needs someone he can rely on no matter what, no matter what comes in, hopefully someone that can take on as many projects as possible in a certain area or, or language combination. Whereas Mr. Direct Client is only looking to buy a translation which is exactly what they have in mind. 99% of the times they don't look, browse professional websites to find potential long-term partners. They go because they need to make a purchase right here and right now. So if you think about it, it's obvious that in order to appeal to Mr. Project Manager, or to Mr. Client, you have to consider their different points of view, which means that Mark, if he wants to succeed in getting this target shift of his right, so be successful in attracting clients and leads 
and conversions from his website, needs to make a mindset shift first. So he has to stop thinking about promoting himself and his services to be hired or to start a cooperation, a long-term one. He has to walk into the mindset shift of promoting his services to sell something. And as simple and as obvious this might be, this is where more most professionals fail when they go online and make the shift from a agency scenario to a direct client scenario. And it's not just about translators, you know. I've been with web designers, I've been working with uh, marketing strategists, I've been working with different kinds of creatives. Um, and when they start when they started actually shifting from, okay, I'm going for the B2B cooperation because marketing agencies, advertising agencies, translation agencies, all sorts of business services agencies often rely on external help. We all know that. But now that these people want to target someone else, they kind of don't know where they are might they might need to tweak things a bit and this mindset shift is essential if you want to step upright and it has of course to be reflected in in your marketing materials and the th and the thing that you use online to get found which is your website now in a typical website for agency client scenario and again I'm talking about of course translation translators websites but this can also be seen in web designers or UX designers uh, web developers etc you if a little Google and a little browsing you will see exactly what I'm telling you here you can see in these kinds of websites with this kind of target audience that the content is structured and presented in a specific way it often resembles an online uh, curriculum so you may have uh, about me background services qualifications uh, technical equipment or technical skills as their uh, website menu items and also um, websites targeted at the middleman persona often come with industry jargon and all the fancy words we use when we talk about our work and nobody else understands outside of our industry that's normal that's absolutely normal and it makes perfect sense if you are targeting a target a target persona within your industry and industry insider similarly in those websites uh, you don't see much personality because it's all about it all derives from that writing and promoting for, for getting hired mentality so you have a very neutral formal what we would call business tone of voice which is nothing but the death of creativity and you have a lot of focus on selling the features of the professional so it's all about the experience the cpd uh, the software you can use, uh, the cat tools you own, uh, the industry qualifications you have acquired, etc, etc. It's kind of an hard sell within the uh, framework of a recruiting process. And these websites are usually not really enticing for anyone but their intended targeted audience. And it should be like that you know when you're uh, communicating writing on your website on your newsletters on your blog to one person you cannot appeal anybody else because each 
uh, person or market segment or marketing persona you call it i like thinking about people because it keeps it real and it keeps it very focused on what we are about to tell now so when you talk to one person you know that you are leaving aside other people that do not have that background that need and that interest that you are trying to tackle within a certain page or a newsletter or a post that's okay but for mr client it doesn't really make sense when he uh, browses sorry for a translator and he founds a website that is designed with agency clients in mind he cannot really make sense of the pieces he finds himself uh, in an online framework he's not really familiar with he finds himself looking at information that we of course take for granted in an industry insider scenario but that really don't speak to his mind because he has the slightest clue about the tools etc just as you have probably little clue about the computer software he uses in his work unless you know you're nerd enough to go and research all the, the software warehouse things your each and every of your client does uses and the result is that if the client doesn't understand what's in front of him, what you're trying to sell, what you're trying to tell, or doesn't feel at ease with it that he does not buy. There is no deal happening because he doesn't feel that you're talking to him so that he would be able to understand him. The problem lies, as I said, in the mindset shift mark and any other marks on the planet need to make and it's all about understanding where your audience is starting from as i said before direct client starts with a purchase mindset to him as much as we know that translation is a service not a commodity not a product a translation is a product that he needs on his desk to complete something so he wants to make a purchase he doesn't want to go and ramble about what's behind making that product he doesn't care about the storytelling he doesn't care about the history or maybe he does but you have to present them things in a way that makes sense to them otherwise there could be no deal possible and the first thing is that when Mr. Client starts with a purchase in mind, the first idea that springs is that of a classical in-person purchase. So you walk into a shop, you browse around the shop windows, all neatly organized in a way that appeals to the client's eye. And we all know that all shops, large uh, retailer shops uh, and brands, have strict guidelines on how you should, you know, arrange the shop windows because it makes a difference. So when their client goes in real life to make a purchase, he finds himself in a very welcoming, recognizable and friendly environment, something that makes him feel at ease, something he can understand quickly with a glance of the eye. And of course, in a shop, he would meet someone that would smile to him and ask them, how are you doing? What's your day like? So is there anything that is getting your attention, etc.? He's in Mark's, in the direct client's mind, purchases start with talking to someone. So the sales process starts with a conversation. So in order to make Mr. Client feel at ease in your online shop, that is your website, it's on the hunt 
for this kind of client, of course, it's much wiser to start thinking from his point of view and try to recreate the feel and the mood of an in-person encounter and of a shopping and sales experience he can understand. And there are two ways you can go about with this. Of course, you can go about creating a website structure that is in line with what he expects and what he is used to. And then you would have, you know, all the tiny bits and pieces, the technical equipment and computer skills wouldn't be in a separate tab on the menu, but would probably be embedded in and weaved in uh, a discussion about your skills in general, as an example. And of course, you go about making him feel at ease and comfortable with the words you use to connect with this specific client. And when I'm talking about direct clients, I'm not really going uh, industry specific because there really isn't anything specific about this. It's all about uh, the general point of view. These kind of considerations on how to create your website works whether you want to target design studios, law firms, uh, dental practices, uh, gyms and wellness center. The problem is that the problem is not a problem. The core of it all is that when you talk to someone to make a sale, uh, to make a sale directly rather than through a middleman. When you are in this kind of scenario, you have to think conversation. And of course, apart from the uh, information architecture you use on your website, so how you categorize and divide and order and present your uh, services and skills and what you have to offer. It also goes down, of course, to the language you would use because you would have to appeal to someone that thinks differently than an agency entity which is hiring freelancers as external collaborators, which is where conversational copywriting comes into play. And when I'm talking about conversational copywriting, I'm talking about crafting sales copy that sounds and has the typical flow and pace and coziness of the conversation. Now, it might be not as uh, immediate to get the difference about conversational copywriting and standard copywriting, but you will uh, certainly understand that if you think of the typical 80s uh, used car salesman and what really goes on on websites that we all <clears throat> visit and use every day, such as uh, for the people who are interested in marketing, it can be um, websites of uh, advertising agencies and marketing agencies, uh, entities like Copyblogger, uh, Sumo for uh, website analysis, etc. You can see on SEMrush website, whatever happens there is mostly conversational copywriting. So there is sales copy, those uh, websites do not write for, for fashion or because of their liking. They do sell and they sell hard and wide on their websites. But the kind of message they convey is put in a way that feels like not a pushy sales force, but a cozy conversation, a dialogue, something that comes up naturally. The object of the sale comes out naturally out of the conversation. And this kind of 
copywriting and we see it really all over the place. It all brings benefits on both sides of the pond. On the client side, reading a piece of conversational copy rather than the hard sell sounds more natural and as well, it is naturally, pardon my stumble on words, is more engaging because it doesn't feel like you are talking to the sales, to the car salesman. It feels like you're talking to someone you might actually like and you might actually trust and it's not trying to pull you out of your money every second. Conversational copy is also uh, fostering and promoting trust at a deeper level. When we see all the glitzy headlines, all the exclamation marks at the end of the sentence, the all caps message, we feel invaded and we feel distrustful because nowadays every client and even us as client have had our, our fair share of people that promise make lots of promises on the websites make lots of promises online and the miracle and have the miracle cure for anything when in fact they don't so conversational copy getting into the flow of using a language that makes us feel more makes us sound more human and actually as people it's more trustworthy than the old uh, formal business tone because it now feels like a barrier the internet world is changing and what really felt like uh, posh and elegant and proper so using the formal address for your user uh, from your website readers or something like that felt proper back 20 years ago but nowadays it's not like that so when you feel when you find someone that still acts like that it kind of feel you makes you feel awkward and out of place and also conversational copy being more natural more closer to what you would do in a normal sales situation in an in-person sales situation which is what every one of us is grown with promotes a stronger connection with your potential client because you come across as a, a person and not just a website page. On your side, using conversational copywriting is actually good because it's more personal. When you engage in a conversation, you normally tend to do what you do. You simply do you as the American says, so you start using your normal reference references to whatever you like or what you have seen. You start uh, using your favorite words and we all have them. I have a thing for old fashioned words. And when I write, and even when I write for my website or a newsletter, I tend to use them because that's what I do. And if I'm having a conversation, it's only natural that these things actually come out. So using a conversational style rather than the formal strict and CV style tone actually gives you more personality. It differentiates you and people do business with people they like and they can connect and relate to. So this kind of uh, copy is actually the key to finding people that think like uh, you and like what you do, so things you can connect with in a different level. Using conversational copy also takes much of the awkwardness of having to sell yourself and your services because it makes you feel more at ease as you write. And of course, being conversational using the words and expressions you would use normally uh, is 
good for the clarity and simplicity of your writing. You can actually make your message heard louder and clearer without using all the convoluted uh, formalities we are used to when discussing the agency client scenario in general. And if you're anything like Mark, at this point, you might fall into the trap of the common thought whether conversational would make sound unprofessional. Now, these things, they only rhyme, but it's not really the same. This kind of bias that being approachable and friendly using common language as being unprofessional dates really back. If you think about it, you will find it in Dickens novels when the people who had to get to be hired by the master had to dress well, behave well and use all the words that they didn't use since they learned them in their only year of school. You have to, when you think of writing and promoting yourself or getting hired, you kind of for fall into of having to dress and behave properly so people see that you're a good deal. But if it were true, it wouldn't really add up to something. Now, if you think about it, there is really nothing that prevents people from being approachable and professional. Now, uh, I know that uh, much of the audience might uh, come from anywhere in the world, so I don't know if you might know some of these people, but uh, Marie Forleo, which is a very, very successful entrepreneur and uh, copywriter, American copywriter and uh, copywriting trainer and uh, benefactor, etc., has a very, very approachable tone on her website but no one would question her professionality and if you don't know her maybe you might know of mm -hmm. sir david Attenborough. and i beg that no i i'm sure bad that no one would deem him unprofessional for using plain language and approachable expressions in his documentaries on the other end, that wins him awards, prizes, and titles because he is good at raising awareness of what he does. So, with Mr. Attenborough or Marie Forleo, or the two together, which might go very well in mind as an example of how conversational and professional can really go hand in hand if done right, if you don't overdo it, if you don't fall into the little traps that come to it. Let's see in the last leg of this presentation, how do you go about writing conversational copy with Mark Self, of course. And the first tip I want to give you is don't write like you talk. This is the worst piece of advice I've seen over and over on copywriting or so-called pro-copywriters. Conversational copywriting isn't about writing like you talk. When you think about it, and even uh, right now, you will notice that when we talk, we tend to stumble and rumble. Our thoughts are fast, and sometimes we don't finish the sentences, or we jump from one concept into another, uh, kind of rushing, because in our heads everything is clear or maybe you have to stumble over a word or two and go back and clarify it a bit. This would be normal in a conversation between two people sitting you know, around the table with good coffee or ice cream in their hands and time, but this doesn't really work in websites. You don't have a second chance, you don't have a chance to uh, clarify things for a reader when he doesn't understand. So conversational copywriting 
isn't about writing like you talk. As all pieces of sales copy, it has to be well thought and well executed. So the first rule of conversational copywriting is actually deciding on a copywriting formula or framework you can use and you can really work, go very classic with the problem agitate solution for a sales page and you can really go about uh, the AIDA formula so uh, copy that evolves from the first raising attention stage to raising interest to eliciting desire to promoting action this kind of frameworks and formulas work mostly for any industries but you have to know them and execute them well so the point is choose a copywriting uh, framework for a sales page use a solid sales page layout don't just ramble on why your product or translation services are the best but then after you have drafted this go back to what you have written and try to make it more focused so you don't look like the salesman we talked about and the second rule of conversational copywriting is actually writing to one person this is something that all copywriters and all copywriting trainers say and this is true for a reason this is one of the first things I learned when I first started copywriting, things I have heard over and over again at any specialization course. You have to write to an audience of one. And there is a very simple reason for that, if you think about it. If you, uh, as a reader, go on a web page and find the sentence that goes like, Oh, so you are, uh, if you are a web designer slash this, uh, fashion designer slash creative studio slash uh, business practice, then I'm the right person for you. Well, that moment, that single moment is where you lose all of your chances of selling your translation service to a, to a Mr. Client. Because that kind of arrangement actually creates a barrier. If you actually started things on the right foot, but then you fall into that trap, trying to appeal to everyone, trying to be everything to everyone at every time, you will lose everyone. Because nobody likes to talk to a flyer. Conversations are about one-to-one so my piece of advice if you work for multiple industries if you uh, have different target personas and you want to appeal them write more pages on your website and tailor one page to one person and one message just don't stop at the marketing persona profile you sketched just picture a real person in your mind. Figure out what they might say, what they might be interested in, and how would you start a conversation with them? What pressures that person the most? And you will find out that even though uh, people, uh, well, of course, we uh, round them up in personas because there are similarities, people are never the same. So. When you write and you write with conversion and conversation in mind, stick to one person. Of course, you don't have to use the name, but figure and picture that person in your mind before you start writing and be very specific. And don't be afraid of missing out just because you are uh, addressing one person or persona, depending on how sophisticated that is. Fear that if you don't rule out in advance the people that you don't want to target with that page, you will start attracting probably lots of traffic, but not many leads.
and sales. Conversion and copywriting tip or rule number three, write like a human. When we speak, we normally use contractions. We start sentences with ends, but however, uh, we repeat words sometimes. We tend to change the pace, change the tone, and use all the words, the little words, the interjections, the moment of, oh, snap, I have forgot something that you normally use. These things, using contraction words, uh, using transition words, not just being like a the print book, but feeling like a tiny bit, not of course all the time, you cannot start any sense and sentence with and and but, but sometimes you can do that and that really helps in keeping the feel and the sound and the flow of a conversation, of a human talking to another human. And same goes for contractions, of course. Number four, steal your client's words. Conversational copywriting has a strong empathetic connection element of empathetic connection, as I mentioned before. And it works a hundred times more when you actually use the words the client would use. Now, if you look at all the um, uh, scheduling apps and tools that are out there, you will see that most of the most famous, such as Trello, Asana, etc., make a great use of this kind of tip and still their clients' words all the time. Uh, use this tool to save time and get things done. As you can hear, this is not our scheduling app uh, is the most cost and time effective solution for your scheduling needs, which is something that very highly resembles what you would normally find in an agency client website, targeted website scenario. Use the words that people use, that the same words that you use when you're not talking about your work. Uh, speak of benefits, just as your clients would. And there is a very, very simple trick to do that. When you get a uh, good uh, referral, when you get a client testimonial, when you get uh, a nice message of thank you for your work, people will tell something to you. Start from there. Source your words from the words your client uses within their inquiries, in their conversations, in the conversation you have with them, in the conversations that happen between them on social media or when they look for advice on client fora. These kind of uh, sources are a treasure trove of conversational language. That brings value because it reflects what the clients wants, needs, feels, and how they would express themselves. And we all know that if we can relate to how a person expresses themselves, we like them more because we feel closer. So this one is, is definitely a keeper. Number five, the rhythm and pace of your writing. I know, I know that for hundreds of posts around the web, you will find the perfect sentence length for your blog post, the perfect sentence length for your social posts, for your website copy, for your newsletters. Forget that, please. Do that for yourself. Because yes, people tend to have a preference for shorter sentences, but when people talk, they don't always use short sentences. And I am living proof of that. I am known for going on for paragraphs and paragraphs when in conversation. People use uh, short sentences that go on a longer piece of concept then stop and think, ask a question, make a full stop, or just use one word as a punchline. So if you're striking for a conversational and approachable tone, 
which is again the tone that gets you the attention and the possibility to keep the conversation going with your client. Stop counting the, the number of words you use in sentences and just focus on writing something that matters using just the words you need for that. And if you find yourself and maybe a little, a little bit too uh, compromised by the trend of the perfect sentence length, go back to your writing and try separating, adding a little variation. So uh, cut a sentence in two, uh, blend some together, uh, use white space, use white space. So it gives the, the reader time to think about what you just said before diving into the next chapter or the next selling point. This kind of rhythm and pace we recognize both in writing and both when uh, reading in our minds. So it really makes sense for us to use a conversational rhythm and pace to your writing. Number six, I touched on this before, but in conversational copywriting, don't be afraid to weave in your favorite words and expressions, things you say uh, in real life, things that your customer might get across in on Instagram uh, when he checks you out there. And not, of course, all the things, but the expressions we use or something that we are really fond of, a motto or uh, our way of saying never mind. Uh, one big part of conversational copywriting outside of websites but also on websites to a lesser extent, uh, mostly on direct mailing, newsletters, and that kind of uh, direct thing, is how you open and close your emails. Every one of us has the pre their favorite way of saying, hi, how do you do, see you, goodbye. And this isn't just for the way we open and close sentences. It's also uh, about the messages we hit more. So, uh, as an example, in my writing, I talk a lot, a lot about uh, conscious writing and uh, mindful writing in a way. So, more quality over quantity and on considering and pondering the words you use a lot. I am in a lot for effective and conscious writing. So this is a message I hit. And if you have those kinds of messages, so if you're all in for productivity, if you're all in for any other kinds of things, it makes sense to weave in these concepts in your sales copy, because that would normally pop out in a conversation with you. You will find yourself talking about optimizing things maybe. Or maybe you will find yourself talking about the grace or the flow of something. Use these words. Use your reference uh, word. Use and source what you say from the language that comes in your, alive in your own universe, and which is your own. So if you are struggling with that, if it doesn't come out naturally for starters, go back uh, to something you wrote maybe a few months ago. Don't look at your website, look at your social networks, look at your private conversations, and you will see uh, your favorite words popping out. And when it comes to sales copy, sprinkle them, sprinkle them wisely to add a of personality and boost the conversation factor. And last but not least, use questions in your copy. Conversations are made of dialogues, of people interacting. So even though people cannot really interact with your sales copy, using a question and some white space every now and then, it's what keeps their mind on the subject keeps them interested, keeps them on the page, uh, getting a nod of agreement 
at certain point of a sales page could be a very good thing for your conversion. Or just introducing your selling points with questions. Do you ever feel like this is very common uh, technique copywriting and it works. It's very common because it works and it works because people feel immediately more engaged and involved when they're talking and discuss and talking to someone that makes questions and waits for their answers. So speaking of questions, I am done with my presentation. So if you have any questions, it's time for you to speak up and thank you for listening in the time. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for your refreshing and inspiring speech and especially for your thank so you. precise, helpful and straight to the point uh, suggestions. Unfortunately, we don't have even a minute for questions and it would be oh, huge. Oh, sorry, I ramble. <laughs> it would be a huge pity to say goodbye to you, but luckily we don't have to and we will meet again on Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, in Zoom room dedicated to future of marketing. So please, if you have any questions or ideas to share and discuss, please join us there. Okay, thank you. There. you. I will see thank you soon. You. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. Thank Bye. You too. Bye. Thanks.